Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Matthew Henderson. Matt Henderson. Keep, te keep telling me that. Um, <laughs> Dr. Henderson is a third-year resident at a pediatric residency program here at Brilliant. Dr. Henderson hails from Orlando, Florida. He attended Elon College, where he specialized in, where he majored in biology, spent some time in medical research at Duke in Florida, and Florida, not Duke in Florida. Uh, he attended uh, Lake Erie School of Osteopathic Medicine uh, prior to coming to Carillion. During his time here at Carillion, he has been the recipient of both the Gold Foundation Award in Humanism in Medicine and the, Ze and the Hokey uh, Award for Mentorship in Medical Student Education. Please welcome Dr. Matt Henderson. All right, is this, the mic's good? I might use the microphone. We're good? All right. So uh, the thing I wanted to talk about today is complementary and alternative medicine. This is a topic that has just sort of fascinated me. When I was in medical school in Florida, the sandy beaches of Sarasota were considered to have a course that aligned well with chakras, and so that sort of teed me off on this whole topic. So let's sort of dive in here. I have no financial disclosures, of course. So objectives of what we want to talk about, effectively, the NIH has put out a big study of complementary medicine and pediatrics, and I took the top four things that were used by children and went through it. Um, briefly, so in this, I think it's worthwhile to talk about the history of it, the trends in use, what the evidence is. Is this worthwhile for our kids, or is this not worthwhile for our kids? And then what are the potential risks out of it? And I want to frame that with a brief discussion of the more traditional allopathic medicine that we use just to sort of lay in how we're going to look at this thing. And then I wanted to give you guys some resources of how to look this up and, and to find more information on in the future, because you're not going to remember what I say today. But if you can remember one Google search, then you're set. So fundamentally, what is complementary and alternative medicine? It's a big, big category that's anything that's not traditional Western allopathic medicine. And I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, complementary medicine is when you have some sort of combination of regular medicine plus a complementary therapy. And alternative would, would be if you were to utilize it just alone by itself for preventing disease, treating disease. Um, and then integrative health um, is a system wherein you're seeking to tie all those together. Uh, my talk is meant to sort of bookend with Dr. Medea's discussion of integrative health that happened a couple of weeks ago. She more focused on supplements, and then I'm taking um, a lot of the rest of things in complementary health for children. So what does this encompass? And I've highlighted what I'm discussing specifically in bold. Um, homeopathy, which we'll talk about. Naturopathy. Naturopathy is a system of using herbs and botanicals to treat disease. Uh, Chinese herbal medicine is just that idea of herbs, botanicals, different animal products used to treat or cure disease um, that comes from the Chinese tradition. You may think it's thousands of years old. Actually, the major codex use was from the 1950s and the Great Leap Forward. Sort of interesting. Arvedic, which I'm sure I am missing from India, other traditional systems, folk medicine in the Native American tradition we have in the States here. Manipulative body-based medicine things. So this is chiropractic or osteopathic, which we'll touch on. Massage therapy as well, which I think we're all relatively familiar with. Um, Biologically-based practices, herbs, botanicals, Supplements, this is a lot of what you're going to see on the shelf at Kroger. Um, amber teething necklaces, we've seen these. We've all seen these. These are those yellow little necklaces that we see our uh, toddlers wear when they come into clinic. The pitch is that they'll help a child have less teething symptoms. Um, there's no evidence that that works, just to spoil the ending for those. But you see them all the time. They're quite popular. Um, Mind-body therapy, so prayer, mindfulness, meditation. The the real nugget here is that it's trying to calm the mind in an effort to help improve the body, which, I mean, you're one person, right? You're a mind and a body. You're all linked together, so of course that makes sense. Uh, yoga can be considered in there too, although some people use yoga exclusively for fitness. Uh, tai Chi, which is sort of a movement-based exercise, which is an uh, Asian thing as well. Creative art or music, and I mean this in the sense of music therapy or art therapy. Not just you like to paint, although that's great. I encourage you all to have hobbies, uh, but this is more using that as a treatment strategy. And then biofield therapies. So these are all based on some sort of energy field in the person. 
Um, the acupuncture uses the meridian field, which is considered a chi field. I wish I had time to get into acupuncture. That's another interesting one. Um, and that by placing the little skinny needles, you can manipulate the chi field to bring on healing in a person or alter their thoughts on addiction. Uh, therapeutic touch, spiritual healing, magnet therapy. So you know those uh, sports magnets, the bracelets you can wear to improve your golf game. That's what that is. Wish we had time for all of them, but we don't. And then um, there's a ton of overlap here, right? So you could go to the doctor of oriental medicine who's north of town here, and they could prescribe you some herbal products, a homeopathic preparation, and then walk you through doing a Tai Chi exercise. So by no means are these exclusively in some disparate domain. There's a tremendous amount of overlap of what gets used and what's available. So when it comes to children, uh, this was the most recent data we have came out in 2015 and went through 2007 to 2012. So 11.6% of kids in the United States have used some sort of complementary and alternative health thing within the past calendar year. It's probably more um, because a lot of this is, you know, at Kroger under the guise of just being regular stuff, um, but as it is. So all forms, we've got 11.6. So supplements of any form, about 5%. Chiropractic manipulation, a little over 3%. Um, yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, about 3%. Deep breathing, that's in the mindfulness meditation sort of category, at least as I discuss it, 3% homeopathy less than two, and then meditation a little less than two as well. Um, there's other ones that are less common as well, but those are some of the big ones. So again, I wanted to just kind of kick through briefly allopathic medicine so we can talk about sort of where, where we come from and our thoughts on things. So we all like to talk about ancient Greeks about everything, so we have Hippocrates. You know, we've all seen the stone bust on our textbook of some sort. He sort of came out with this idea of a medical diagnosis, that's of something that's wrong with you. He thought of a lot of imbalances of humors, but anyways, he was the one who sort of started that concept. And then we come into sort of the renaissance of medicine and a scientific understanding in the 1800s especially. Uh, Louis Pasteur interviewed or introduced the idea of a germ theory of disease, that there was bacteria that could cause disease, and that bacteria weren't spontaneously generated out of broth. Um, this took years to disseminate. So all of these sort of fundamental things that we now take for granted, people were debating the germ theory of disease in the U.S. up until 1900. Um, you can find some now who debate it, but that's kind of in the flat earth category of conspiracy theory, I think. Um, Joseph Lister was instrumental in the idea of antiseptic techniques for surgery and saw a marked improvement in surgical outcomes. If you want to Google someone after this, Ignis Smellwise is a very interesting one. So this was a physician in Austria back in the 1800s. He occupied uh, Dr. Casal's sort of chief resident role on a maternity ward in Austria. So there were two maternity wards in the city, one run by the medical students and one run by a midwifery service. And when the women came to the maternity ward, they begged and begged to be on the midwifery service because the medical student service had about a 10% mortality rate. And the midwifery service was about 4%. And so everyone in the city knew this and wanted to be on the one where they had a better chance of survival, gosh. So, Ignis went through and did this tremendous survey to see what is it about these two services? Why are we having such different outcomes of the women on the service? Did a very intense review, is it the piety of the medical students is lacking, was one of the theories, going through to see what it was. Well, what it ended up coming to the conclusion was is the medical students in the morning, they would come in, you know, bright and chipper, and they would go to the anatomy lab, and they'd perform dissections on the cadavers. And then they would come up and they would go on their obstetric rounds, assist in deliveries, and do all that. The midwifery service didn't go to the cadaver lab. No one washed their hands back then. So he theorized that there were cadaverous particles the medical students came with from the cadaver lab and something of the tinge of death would then go on to the women and cause them bad infections and then to die. So what he introduced was the idea of we need to cleanse this off of our hands before we go on rounds and assist in deliveries of children. So he used the dilute lye soap for people to wash their hands. Mortality went from 10% to 1% and 4% to 1% respectively. Then this idea of hand washing, of course, took years and years to disseminate just like everything else. Interesting story, worth your Wikipedia time. <clears throat> um, in the US though, when we get to a real push to modernize medicine, the Flexner Report is one of the considered things. This was in 1910. After the Civil War, the federal government looked and said, well gosh, what we're doing isn't all that great, we're having good outcomes here, bad outcomes there. The Flexner Report was an effort to standardize medical education across the United States of America. 
Um, in doing so, about half of all medical schools closed for not meeting uh, the rigor criteria, the quality criteria. And they all based it off of what at the time was considered a German model of medicine. And some of the medical journals at that point in time you had to be able to speak and read German for, which I'm glad I don't have to now. Um, and John Hopkins Hospital was held up as one of the main institutions here. And the fundamental principles of allopathic, so we know how to weigh off other principles. So we tend to, we use medicines to treat some sort of biologic process of disease. Maybe you're using an antibiotic that disrupts the cell wall synthesis. Maybe you're giving a statin that reduces the cholesterol production in the liver. Um, we seek to prevent disease with sanitation and immunizations, and then surgery to remove any sort of disease tissue, correct anatomy. And then more recently, since really the 70s, we've seen this conceptual shift as the emergence of genetics has played a role, where now we can have some sort of idea of predicting what the risk of someone's disease would be, or even to tailor therapies. Um, Molecular biology is in that too, and that's been a new driver for developing new therapies and antibiotics. And then lifestyle modification, though uh, some of that's been around for a while. But now people aren't dying of typhoid, they aren't dying of infectious disease, they're dying of a lot of lifestyle-related issues. And then going through this, we've all seen the pyramid of data analysis where you want a large systemic review, um, meta-analysis is preferred as well. And in preparing this, one of the challenges is complementary alternative health is not a tremendously well studied subject, even though a lot of it's been around for a long time. Um, and pediatric studies are even more lacking. So I did the best I could with all the available data, and I'll present it as is. All right, let's jump into homeopathy, one of my favorites. So this developed in the late 1700s by a German Samuel Hahnemann. The idea of it was that like cures like. What they meant by this was that if some substance that you took in a, a large quantity caused bad symptoms, then taking an extremely dilute volume of that same substance would in a way cure those symptoms. Um, the how that works is sort of debatable. Um, the thing that gets proposed now is an idea of water memory in that you have some sort of memory of the effect of the drug in the water that then absorbs the bad juju out of your own system. I'll go through an example in a second. This is available at every Kroger in America. Your patients are using this so they may not realize it. So as an example, insomnia, so coffee keeps you up, so super dilute coffee would help to relieve you of insomnia, a la Coffee Cruda, available for $8.99. So when, when you look at the C here of the dilution, so what that means is that you would put one drop of, like, coffee filter, just coffee, into 99 parts water. So one part in 99 parts water, that's one C. Then of that substance, you would take one part in 99 other parts, that's 2C now. You go down the line, you get to 30C. So 1 in 100, effectively, is a C. There's also an X system of 1 in 10. Um, C seems to be the more common. And the thought is that the further down the dilutionary line you go, the more potent the preparation is. Um, you can find these either as like a tincture in a liquid, or you can find them dripped over uh, like a sugar pill. So, and the, they're about the size of a chapstick. You'll see them. Oh, yeah, you'll see them here. Um, so. I'll use the mouser for the, the sake of those watching on TV. So all of these are those little pills like that. Um, this one is for fussiness and gas. Um, and you can also find there's a lot of gas and colic tablets that are homeopathic preparations. You can see it labeled up here in the front, the Highlands Baby. Just, you know, if you ask parents in your, in your continuity clinic or your clinic what they're using, a lot of them are going to mention these things. And they, Again, they may not realize that they're homeopathic. They just see colic. My baby's fussy. Gosh, I'll try it. Trends in use, 1.8% of kids in 2012. And then homeopathic practitioners is sort of another topic for another day. 0.2% of children saw that. Does it work? No, not really. Um, there's no evidence that homeopathic works any better than placebo at treating or curing any disease. Um, when you look, just like with all data, Smaller studies, pilot trials, poorly blinded trials can have odd results. So be wary of that when you're looking through this. There's lots of smaller homeopathic studies that show some positive benefit, but in larger meta-analysis and examination, the benefit really seems to go away. Come on. There we are. So we have some large bodies that have weighed in on this pretty firmly. Uh, the NIH, Australia, and UK have all relatively unequivocally said that there's really no benefit to using homeopathic preparations. 
they're still on the shelf because it's, you know, in America, we don't regulate supplements really much. Um, but anyway, so you know, so you see this when it comes in your clinic. Adverse effects, though, r really not much. These are tremendously diluted things. There's no large population level data to say it's happening with this frequently, frequency, but there's certainly case reports of problems thought to be stemming from whatever the ingredient is that's used in the formulation of the pills themselves or some other thing in the preparation. Um, there are a couple cases where it was direct toxic effect of the substance um, and thought to be that it was an improper dilution that was done. <clears throat> All right, moving on to chiropractic. So <clears throat> chiropractic is a system that focuses on the body and especially the spine and its role in disease in that a couple different things. Either disease somewhere in the body can be manifested by malalignments or subluxations in the spine, or that subluxations in the spine can cause or contribute to disease. Um, there's a wide variety of opinions and practitioners of chiropractic as well, some feeling more that the spine is center of all disease, some feeling more that chiropractic is a supportive care akin to physical therapy that can help you with dealing with disease or musculoskeletal disease. <clears throat> But the, the nugget here is that by manipulating the spine, you can make life better for someone. Um, founded by uh, Daniel David Palmer, late 1800s, he was one of the first couple of classes of AT still in the osteopathic medicine, which we'll touch on in a minute, too. Um, so 4.8% of Caucasian kids have gone to a chiropractor within the last calendar year. A uh, little less of numbers when we look at Hispanic, African Americans, or children of other races. But this is a very, very common thing. And then you're asking, well, why are they going to the chiropractor? So most everyone's going for a musculoskeletal concern. And when you specify, then you get to the, the numbers that are a little bit lower. So people com coming in with issues of having a headache, muscular sprain, asthma, we'll talk about that, otitis media, gait posture, colic, um, really a lot of things that you wouldn't traditionally think of as having a spinal component as a primary source of disease like asthma. And the, you're seeing big numbers that all overlap here because they're coming in for a musculoskeletal concern, including asthma. So that's why they're sort of double dipping in categories and you're seeing the 40% and all that. Does it work? Well, when we ask Cochrane, uh, there's some reasonable evidence that it works, especially in headaches, headaches of all types, migraine types. Um, they didn't necessarily specify whether this was exclusively tension headaches. It, it was seen to be in all, all types. And there was some offering up that this may be as effective as amitriptyline. Um, and certainly, migraines and headaches are a hard thing to take care of no matter what. When we look at it for things such as chronic back pain, there's no clear statistical benefit, but there is some potential benefit in there. Um, again, this is going to be study-based, and a lot of this data is adult but it did include adolescents down to 14 in the meta-analysis. So take it as you will. Um, I think generally the back pain that a 14-year-old experiences is going to be more acute, likely sports-related as opposed to an adult um, who's had back pain for 20 years, and that's sort of a different can of worms. And there's no large pediatric trial, so I presented the best of the adult data that we have. So let's look into what trials we do have for pediatric-type conditions. So asthma, does chiropractic work? for asthma. We have one randomized control trial, um, which found no difference between chiropractic treatment and a sham treatment, which mostly focused on uh, manipulations of the lower extremity as opposed to the thorax. This was a, it was really a good study um, in that they looked at the things you'd want, really the spirometric values of people, uh, baseline at the end of two months of chiropractic treatment, and then two months after that. Uh, and they found no statistical difference between them. What about otitis media? So there's a, a variety of sort of head manipulations. Um, I know I've heard of something called the gall breath technique where you manipulate the jaw out of a hope of drawing fluid out of the eustachian tube. Um, so there's no evidence that uh, OMM or chiropractic is superior to sham in reducing the frequency of, of otitis. And uh, OMM was included in this one, though it isn't in some of the chiropractic literature, but we'll touch on that in a second. Too. And what about colic? Man, no one wants a fussy baby at home. You don't sleep much. So some of the studies have shown potential benefit in reduced crying time, but they tend to be plagued by blinding problems. And by that, what I mean specifically is that the parent was there and observing whether the child underwent a chiropractic manipulation or a sham manipulation where they're just swaddled by one of the nurses in the clinic for 15 minutes. 
And then the parent is the primary reporter of the colic in the child. So if you have an unblinded person who knows what treatment group the kid was in and then is the primary data reporter, you're asking for bias in that instance. However, there's a single trial where the child was brought into a separate room where they were either held by a nurse for 15 minutes or underwent adjustment for 15 minutes that found no statistical difference in crying time or symptoms of colic. Um, and I, I always kind of think maybe it's just therapeutic for babies to be held by pediatric nurses too. That's okay. <clears throat> Safety of chiropractic care. So there are case reports. Um, if the, the lower bullet I have here, so this was a larger chart review of a big center that said that one in 100 patients experienced worsening of symptoms, um, but they didn't have any large adverse effects. And then there are case reports of more serious adverse effects. There was one instance of quadriplegia of a child who had a spinal tumor that underwent manipulation. Um, and there are also reports of children who have delayed treatment because they've been going to a chiropractor as opposed to going to a neurologist or getting an MRI or, or getting further workup into what their condition was. Um, hard to say, though, based on case reports, what the final population prevalence, prevalence of adverse effects would be. But take it as you will. It's not fully benign. Um, and higher velocity, higher intensity manipulations are associated with worse pain following that, as really you would expect, right? Osteopathy, I'm sort of bookending into chiropractic in this. Uh, forgive me, DOs who may feel strongly about this. Um, so to touch on osteopathy, so osteopathy is an effort to combine Western allopathic medicine with osteopathic manipulation and really to get the best evidence out of both. This was made in a philosophy that with a goal of treating the whole person where they are, though treating the whole person is kind of part and parcel to most medical schools these days. Founded in the 1800s, uh, A.T. Still was an MD by training. He was a doctor in the Civil War. He saw his wife and three children die of infectious disease despite the best available treatments of the day. He took this, was of course dissatisfied at the death of his family and said, well, what can I do to improve this because What's working in medicine isn't working for my family. So he thought to combine musculoskeletal manipulation and then the best of what was available of the pharmacopoeia of the day, and that's how we got osteopathy. Um, OMM is the manipulative component of that, which is a hands-on way of diagnosing and helping to mitigate disease. It tends to have less focus on the spine in comparison to chiropractic, though practices will vary. Um, more focus on skeletal muscles and assisting lymphatic drainage through relaxing of muscles and diaphragms. Um, when it comes to spinal manipulation, though, I, I think really the therapies are, are quite similar. Forgive me, DO2 may feel otherwise. Um, and I, I don't know that we're going to see, if chiropractic doesn't have tremendous evidence for low back pain, I don't think that osteopathy is going to present a markedly different thing, frankly. Um, and then as it comes to the United States of America, 26% of people in chairs of United States medical schools in 2015 are in a DO program. So this is a quarter of people. The rates are going up and up and up. I know in our program we have a fair amount of DOs as well. All right, next topic, prayer. We get to talk a little about ancient history. I'm excited. So we're talking about the history of everything else. So the first evidence that we have of human prayer arises somewhere about 50,000 BCE. Um, this was in buried remains of bears that was found uh, that were buried in a, in a sort of ceremonial way. And then we get to some of the first idols, the statues, the Venus of Willendorf is a German statue. So 28 to 25 BCE. So the thing that makes us think like this isn't just a doll that someone made and this might have religious or more larger significance would be the exaggerated features of the doll and the lack of features. So one, if this was intended to be a realistic depiction of a person, you would expect to see facial features, which we lack, and arms, which we also lack. There's exaggerated reproductive features, though, of an exaggerated breast and hip. So it is thought that this doll may be um, some sort of idol of fertility significance to whichever ancient tribe was uh, having it. Um, there's similar dolls that were found in this area as well. Talk about history, talk about history, right? Um, in terms of scientific study, when we're talking about prayer, though, so defining prayer is a difficult thing because prayer means a lot of different things to different people, and getting at that something testable is hard. 
Um, is this a self-described discourse that one has with God or God? Um, is this participating in religious study of the Talmud? Um, is this attending a religious service? Or what about participating in a prayer group or a service group? And what about having someone else pray for you? So I pulled out some of the interesting studies that I think you guys might like. And then uh, trends in use. So this is Pew Center data from 2015. Um, so 77% of adults, again, I'll go through what we have for kids, but 77% of adults consider themselves as religiously affiliated. And uh, if you look at the top line, if I use the laser pointer, it makes the whole thing mess up, which is why I'm not. So we've seen about a 6% decline, at least in this data, over a seven-year period. 55% say they pray daily. Um, there's no large population data on children now. But we do have some data on how children feel and their thoughts on prayer within the regards to specific conditions. So in teenagers with sickle cell disease, 73% of them prayed. And 35% of them prayed specifically for help in dealing with their disease condition, for help in pain or or treatment. Uh, children with inflammatory bowel disease, so 59% of them either prayed or thought, sought some sort of spiritual intervention. And they, to get a control group, they found kids in the, these GI practices who were there for constipation, who were praying um, at about 12%. Um, and then, this doesn't surprise me at all, but children who failed frontline chemotherapy, 83% of them pray. And then 52% say that they've either increased the frequency or have started praying for the first time. So this is, regardless of what we as clinicians or you as a person may feel specifically about prayer or religion, this is something tremendously important to our patient population. And I, I think it bears discussion with them if it's important to them. So we don't have a lot of prayer as treatment data, but we do have some associative data, which I think is interesting. Um, so when it comes to youth, prayer and religious affiliation is considered to be a resiliency factor that has some protective effect against things like depression. It also has some association with positive coping strategies, such as uh, increased social connectedness, um, having a, an adult mentor that they feel like they can talk with, as well as having a sense of humor, which I think is probably a good thing for life, have a sense of humor. And we do have an interesting nugget here from the nurses' health studies. This is a big uh, population cohort study that followed 74,000 people, women, through their lives. And um, they found that attending religious service once a week or more was associated in a 33% all-cause reduction in mortality, 33% compared with controls. And that was accounting for the rate of smoking, obesity, all the confounding things that you might expect. So something about prayer has potential to be protective for people's lives in the future. Um, though, again, this is associative, not causative data. Are they participating or doing something else in their lifestyle? Yeah, potentially so, absolutely. And this data doesn't uh, get into what that may or may not be. What about intercessory prayer? So this is having someone pray for you and if you are sick. So um, no consistent benefit or harm, but I pulled out two of the more interesting adult studies that you might care to know about. So some of the larger ones, so we took kids, or I'm sorry, we, this was adults, uh, after discharge from the cardiac floor and followed them, and they were told that you will or won't be prayed for randomly assigned, no difference in outcome um, as measured by death, arrest, or need for, um, uh, you know, some other procedure to be done over a 26-week period. And this one I, I thought was super interesting. So. 1,800 people after having uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. So they were randomized into three groups. Either the first two groups were you were being prayed for and you don't know whether you're being prayed for or not. And the third group was you're being prayed for and you definitely knew you were being prayed for. So the first two groups had statistically equal number of complications for the um, uh, first, the 14 days, day of surgery and 14 days after. So the first two groups were that people were blinded, didn't know whether it was the, the same, the same amount of outcome. Uh, for them not knowing if they were being prayed for. The third group, the people who definitely knew they were being prayed for, they had a much higher rate of complications uh, seen following the operation. Um, my wife and I talked about this, and she always helps me with these things. And she said, imagine that you're sitting there in the gurney, you know, and the doctor comes and says, oh, Mr. Henderson, we want to enroll you in a study. And here's the thing, uh, you know, it's on prayer, and you're definitely going to be prayed for. <laughs> sick are you? <laughs> no, the doctor's going to have to go. Oh, so 
anyways, and, and that in a nutshell is sort of what the author said is, is there an expectation among the patients of someone's looking over my shoulder and praying for me and then did that cause them some distress or make them more likely to have complications? Safety, prayer is really a safe intervention. Um, there can be some potential dangers though. If someone's refusing medical intervention for the sake of exclusively engaging in spiritual healing, then they may have delay in treatment or they may not seek treatment at all. Um, there's certainly things in the news that you can find to that end with children. We've seen that before. Um, and it'd be remiss of me not to mention that religion has had a long history in this world and not all of it is peachy. Um, I think that a realistic expectation is that your patient is not going to engage in any extremist behavior though. Fair? All right, mindfulness meditation. So what we're talking about here, these are things designed to achieve a sense of calm in the person. Meditation is more offered as an umbrella term for anything that achieves a sense of a calm. Um, meditative techniques would include things such as repeating of a mantra while sitting quietly. So this is, you know, you see on TV the guy uh, cross-legged saying om, right? Um, guided imagery things, yoga, and all of this has a goal of trying to reach a state of mental quiet. Mindfulness is involving focus on a specific thing that your body does. So breathing, posture, movement as you walk, move, dance, yeah, whatever it may be, that are all to a goal of reaching a sense of calm. Um, thought originally to have arisen out of the Buddhist tradition or Hindu tradition, but you can find similar examples, I think, in most historical religious traditions as well. Certainly they're there in um, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. 2.6% of people engage, or children engaged in some sort of deep breathing exercise or meditation, and 1.2% for of yoga, and um, it, it didn't specify whether that was to uh, just for fitness or for mindfulness. As it's studied, you're going to see these two words pop up a lot. So mindfulness-based stress reduction and based cognitive therapy. So stress reduction, so that includes things like body scanning. So the, how that works is that you would focus on just the sensation that you have in your feet and your ankles and then walking up with the goal of retrieving a sense of calm. Breathing exercises, so you can try this at home, right, in the car where you breathe in and you focus on the feeling of breath as it enters your lungs and you breathe out. So it's meant to be a grounding exercise that makes you focus on here and now as opposed to worrying about the grand rounds you have to present this morning or whatever it may be. Walking meditation is a focus on your footfall against the ground, the feeling of the ground under your foot. Sensory focus is in that category too. Maybe you're eating and you're focusing on exactly the, the texture of the food in your mouth. Um, and for all of these common modalities in the study groups are meeting about once a week for it. Uh, Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is a way of focusing on your thoughts are just thoughts and they don't carry any specific weight. So we all, I'm sure, have experienced times where we have perseverated on bad things that have happened in the past or worries of now. And the idea here is helping someone say, you know, I'm really worried about my sister or whatever, and take that thought and do it non-judgmentally. It doesn't reflect anything good or bad. It's just a thought that I worry of my sister, and then you let it go, and you don't let it have a larger impact on you. It's calming, right? My voice is getting calm. Um, Overall, these are thought to reduce the negative self-talk pattern that can happen in anxiety and depression and of uh, perseverating and worry about things that you've done in the past. Um, those are thought to be main features of maintaining depression is a focus on negative thought. Efficacy. So, there's actually some good evidence for mindfulness and meditation. Um, we've seen reduction in anxiety, depressive symptoms, and stress symptoms uh, in children. Some little caveats twist to that though are the greatest effect is seen in kids who are coming into a clinic with concerns about anxiety and depression. Um, if you take, there are other studies that are done of just taking random groups of fifth graders from class A and class B, you don't see as much effect in that setting. So it's more, it seems to have more benefit for targeted interventional therapy. When um, you take kids of different ages, Adolescents are much more able to engage in abstract thought, and they seem to do better with this, which doesn't surprise me too much. Um, however, pre-teenage children have shown some benefit out of it, too. 
ADHD is something that's been studied in extensively. There's no clear statistical benefit for its use in ADHD. There are concerns that when you look at large data samples out of meta or in meta-analysis out of, of mindfulness-based therapies. So it's hard to blind someone into a sham mindfulness session. Some of the things that are done have been lectures, but a lecture is different. You know what group you're in if you're getting a lecture versus you're participating in some guided imagery. So it's hard to, it's hard to isolate sometimes what is the true effect of mindfulness versus just being in the, the, the group for a while. Um, some of the common controls so that get used would be weightlisted patients um, or age-matched controls. A weightlisted patient is still seeking mindfulness-based therapy, so take that as you will. It certainly would be considered to confound the data. <laughs> mindfulness is a safe thing. You're not going to, there's no adverse effects found with mindfulness. All right, so let's take a step back. Let's look at the big picture of all the complementary and alternative health stuff that we have. So potentially, there's different and new ways in complementary health that we can find to treat disease. Um, many of them are safe. Some of them don't have efficacy, though. And then I think it's worth remembering when we look at this field of complementary health, which is this huge grab bag, that a lot of the things that we take for granted today were really controversial in their time. So is there somewhere in the complementary world a new therapy that really can be a benefit to people? Maybe it's mindfulness. Um, and I don't think we ought to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just paint all complementary health as being worthless. Certainly it's important to our patients and it's something that they're engaging in. However, no free lunch. So ineffectual treatment, um, so homeopathy, it's, I think it's the ethical thing for us. If we have good proof that something does not work, to try and remove it from the pharmacopoeia of what people use. Um, the United States is unique in how it approaches its supplements, where <laughs> as long as it doesn't kill people, it can be on the market. And it has a sticker that says, uh, not FDA indicated to treat, prevent, cure any disease. Um, but if it's ineffectual, I think we need to advise our patients that I don't think this is going to help you and your child. Especially with the supplements, there can be limited quality control. They're not regulated as drugs, they're regulated as foods. So the dosages between batches has a wide variety of, of variability. Um, sometimes there's instances of fraud where there's no active substance within the, the tablet or formulation itself. Um, there can also be side effects and problems of some alternative supplement or thing interacting with medicines that someone's already taking. I'll give you something to look at for that too so you can check. Um, and then also, if someone has a problem, are they going to go to an alternative health practitioner who is not best equipped to help them in diagnosis, referral, or management of that disease? And will that delay in diagnosis harm the person? Uh, certainly there's instances of people with cancer or problems like that that have been going to a naturopath or a chiropractor and not going to their regular physician and been all the worse for it. And nothing's free. So uh, all of this costs the patient's money. And when I spend money, I like to know that it's on something that's worthwhile and going to last. Some of the complementary stuff I don't think meets that standard. Um, and especially if, if you have a patient who's already set that they're going to go to a chiropractor or what have you, I think it's worth mentioning to them and prefacing the idea that, well, this person may not be um, as on board with things like vaccination that have, you know, obviously shown benefit in children. If you can look, there's um, some studies on the attitudes of chiropractic students coming out of school towards vaccination, which is generally negative, although that's not everyone. Um, but if they're going to some alternative practitioner, I, I think it's worthwhile to, to have a preface conversation with the patient about, you know, that you may hear them talk about vaccines and autism or vaccines and toxicity, and really there's no data for that. And, you know, be the first little nugget in their mind about thinking about that so then they aren't uh, waylaid later. And then what do you do if someone comes in you and says, oh, you know, Dr. Tallman, I'm thinking of doing this homeopathic whatever. How do you counsel that patient? So some key things that I think are important, keep an open dialogue with the patient. Um, if you just kind of want to lay the hammer down and discourage them, that can be 
alienating and put a wall between you and the patient that I, I think is harmful to the larger conversation and trust relationship you have with them. So don't embarrass them. Don't belittle them. Just take it and then talk about it earnestly with them. If you don't know, say, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not as familiar with that therapy. But let me look it up and we can talk about it with the next well visit or sick visit or whatever it is. Um, the NIH offers this model of, you know, our, our little uh, Punnett square. Uh, if it's safe and effective, go for it. That makes sense. Um, if it's effective and has concerns, um, then don't. Now, you're going to have a lot of people who fall into this top right tolerate category of there's no good evidence for efficacy in it, but there's no big harms out of it. So I, I think then you have that conversation of, I don't know that this is going to help your kid, um, but it's probably not harmful, and then seeing what the patient thinks about it. Because at the end of the, the day, it's their body and their health, and as long as they're not doing something tremendously harmful to their child, it's their decision. Certainly, if it's not safe and it's not effective, that's the patient where you need to have the conversation of, look, I have serious concerns that this is going to be harmful to your child, and this isn't going to help their sickle cell or whatever it is that they're concerned about seeking this therapy. Now, where can I look up more information? Because, again, you're not going to remember anything I talk about, and I understand that. So there's a couple different things. The NIH has a really good website. So here it is in pink. I just shrank it. Um, you're not going to remember that. You're not going to remember the National Institute of Complementary Health. Just Google NIH and Complementary Health, and then you'll find it. It'll be the first link on uh, Google. So here's what it looks, though. And you're going to click on Health Info and Topics A to Z. So you can find this no problem. And then you can scroll down, and you can find all kinds of things, and it'll have blurbs, and it's relatively patient-friendly, and then there's a physician thing with resources as well. So that's a, probably the easiest way to find more information as things evolve in the field. Oh, mouse. Um, Cochrane Review really does a great job and has large reviews on a lot of complementary things, too. And certainly that, that's an extensive database with a lot of material for you to go through and really sink your teeth into. Um, there's the Natural Medicines database as well, which primarily focuses on supplements where you can find medication interactions. Up to date has some sporadic stuff for supplements too, which is, uh, can be useful as well. What questions do we have? Any questions in the room? Up front, all right, hang on. So for a lot of these medications, or a lot of the alternative therapies, the main concern is really financial toxicity. So at what point on that Punnett square of um, benefit and harm do you start considering financial? Well, I, I think that's going to be patient by patient. And you, you raise a great point of this is expensive. You know, like the, the homeopathic bottles are about nine bucks each. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned the pictures I took, those are from the Kroger on Brambleton. And the, uh, the homeopathic aisle, that's from uh, Earth Fair right here on Electric. So th these are around, right? Um, I, I think you have that discussion in, in the start. You know, when patients are saying, like, oh, well, there's this stuff I saw for colic at Kroger. And you can say, you know, I don't know that much of it works. If you see it and it says homeopathic, I'd just skip it. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable way to approach it, though. Really nice talk. Thank you. Um, I would add that our numbers are going up skyrocketing right now because from the time of the last study, all the cough and cold medicines, the age indications went way up. The, the homeopathic products saw that as a hole in the market and have flooded us. Your Zarbies and your Highlands and these other products so our patients are coming in on a daily basis, multiple times a day, talking about these. And, you know, that's one of the conversations I have. A lot of people believe that they're helping, and that's great. Maybe there's some placebo effect. Maybe there is some effect. But talking to them about the cost of that in relative to the potential efficacy is important. So I agree with you 100%. Have the conversation. When the parents go, I knew that thing didn't work. <laughs> okay, great. But those numbers are going way up because we're, you know, probably, I don't know, probably 30% of my patients yesterday were trying one of those. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you for the talk. 
My question has to do with the FDA and the role of regulation. So I know that with a lot of diet products, the FDA doesn't necessarily have domain or jurisdiction over regulating them. What's that like in the CAM space? Uh, same. So the, with, with supplements, they're regulated as foods, um, so they just have to not be tremendously dangerous, but there's no burden of proof to provide efficacy. So if you, you know, read your amoxicillin label, that is an FDA proven or an FDA indication to treat strep throat. And um, that's the burden of proof for drugs, but for supplements, there is none. So you'll, that's why they have the disclaimer that's mandated on all the packages that says this product does not prevent, treat, or cure any disease um, as a, a warning to people. So, so, so there is none, and most of it exists on the market in that form. Okay. <laughs> you can uh, unmute the phones here real fast. We've got a few minutes. If you're on the line and you have a question, um, just give us a second. If you do not want to ask a question or make a comment, please put your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Hey, does anyone on the line have a question? Want to make a comment? Jeopardy theme song, three, two, one. Okay. Thank you very much, sir.